This is our first time live streaming on Facebook and uh, also on QQ. I hope uh, it goes If you do have any problems with the internet, please bear with us. We are also going to upload the video afterwards, so if you miss anything or you don't have time to watch, don't worry, it will be available later. You can submit uh, questions. If you want to ask any questions to our speakers today, just submit them on the live stream. Our team here are monitoring the questions and we'll uh, ask them to the panels at the end. Did I miss anything? No. You have to remember that when you're wearing the mic, don't talk, because I did that last time. Oh, so if I'm not wearing the mic, <coughs> oh. I shouldn't talk. Okay, well, continue. yeah, okay, you're right. I'm passing it to you. So, so you guys okay. know at the end you have to bring your chair in Yeah. for the panel discussion. You each grab whichever, a chair. Whichever side we're at. Whichever so side you're at, yeah. Okay. Cool. Everybody's so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it's 7 o'clock? Okay. Um, I think it's time for us to get started. Hi. Welcome to the lovely uh, mailman offices here in Shanghai, China. We are giving a live stream today to help DMOs with their social marketing here in China. We've got three great speakers, well, two great speakers and me. Um, we have Michael, who is the uh, head of the tourism team at the Mailman Group. They're an agency based here in China with over 10 years' experience. We have Kim from Park Lu, and she's uh, been running a KOL platform for the past few years. And she's going to be talking about KOL strategies that have really um, worked in China. And finally, I will be talking about how to manage your content. So we've got three quite different talks. Um, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I'm going to let Michael start, and uh, we'll just let things flow. Please bear with us if there are any challenges. Just leave your questions or any other comments you have in the uh, on the live stream. And uh, thank you very much. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce myself. I'm Michael. We do a tourism agency business here at Mailman. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is how we're going to influence the Chinese tourists beyond just looking at social. I think the China digital landscape is massive. I think it's important that you understand how the consumer journey looks and where uh, each channel is able to influence along the consumer journey. So uh, what I call is the China digital ecosystem. Um, some of the clients we currently manage now, we've been around since 1999. The tourism business really started to take off maybe four or five years ago when we launched Brand USA in China. Uh, right now we manage clients such as Simon Shopping, New York City, uh, Visit Illinois, and a bunch of uh, different kinds of DMOs that we focus just on marketing Chinese tourists to go visit uh, destinations abroad. So this is the main uh, chart that I want everyone to really pay attention to. Um, our core business is right here. Right? You can also put some of WeChat and Sina Weibo into your loyalty program right here, but it's important to note how expansive a consumer journey is. So everybody who's starting to start to travel, wants to find more about a brand, they're always going to most likely start with search. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? Uh, what's the best place to go rock climbing? It all starts with search, and that's where your company has to be really, really smart and uh, even invest money into figuring out how can I get my awareness a lot bigger. I think social is always a key portion where you can build your KOL program, which Kim will we'll talk about a little bit later, um, but also build a content strategy, get your brand well known. For us, when we look at social, the number one thing for us when we're at the familiarity stage is to get people to love your brand. That's number one. Uh, social should be fun, it should be engaging, you should create content that people can share. Um, and then as we move along, which we, which we work with a lot of brands on, a, a lot of companies, they do consumer marketing and then they focus this particular area as part of their trade marketing, which they work with like airlines and uh, tour, tour agencies to try to get people to book and to, to actually go travel to their destination. So you'll see like Chunar, Sea Trip, uh, Tunio and other uh, channels where people can make bookings to actually go travel. Um, and then when you get to the purchases, actually this is the area where you can really spread your content out. So if I'm creating long form content on uh, WeChat, I want to also think about, well, I have my closed network of uh, followers that are reading my content, but how can I make sure this content's being heard outside of my bubble? And that's where you have to focus on bigger channels that already have a lot of UGC content to, and also a very targeted audience such as Mafungo or uh, Chongyo, which is huge networks that we consistently work with to uh, push our, our content out to our key demographic. Um, and here I put a bunch of live streaming logos, but you can also uh, put WeChat and Sina Weibo here. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to close that loop. So 
This is after someone has already made the purchase, they've gone. Now we're looking for them to get their UGC content, the user-generated content. They're posting photos, uh, they're writing about their experiences, and you want to be there to talk to your talk to your followers. You know, get them to share with you. And this is where campaign build uh, will, will, will create this loyalty loop where they're going to go back and go, if they're going to New York City a second time, they're searching for something different. And so your marketing strategy should be getting smarter over time. Uh, and then here's a, here's a general bubble. So what I'm going to go through is just the three major networks, which we call BAT, which is just Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. I'm sure everybody heard of them. They have huge networks. They um, many different kinds of apps across many different ver uh, business verticals. Um, what you see here is actually what, what I explained. So this, if you look at that bubble, is the entire China ecosystem. Uh, a lot of people will start, tend to start towards this middle into the inner part. So you're already diving straight in. You're trying to talk to your consumers at a social level. But if you're a brand that's less well known and you don't, and people don't know about you, you're gonna, it's gonna be harder to penetrate into the middle. So if you're working on a strategy on how can I influence across the entire China digital ecosystem, you want to start at the very awareness stage. And of course, it depends on the level that you're at. So how many people know you, where you should be, depends on where your marketing investment should go first, and then you can start building up your marketing channels. And everything takes time over, over time. Um, and so I'll walk you through. I'm just going to give you like this huge, really messy picture of each one of these just so you can see how expansive the networks are. Um, so this is Baidu. Baidu is in all sorts of different stuff. They do search engine. Um, they have financial. They have gaming, Wi-Fi. They have video channels. And at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of a, a, a bit of a strategy that we put together for one of our clients on how if you're involved in, say, search over here under SEM, how you can work uh, an investment into search to working with a video channel such as Aichi and doing cross-media uh, exchange to make... Uh, uh, a smarter investment into a particular channel like Baidu. Uh, here's Alibaba. So everyone knows actually what Alibaba is. Here's all the things that they own. You know, whether they own a percentage of it um, or they own more of it. So they actually invest into Weibo. They're in the key online channels such as Chongyo and uh, Alitrip. Um, they also have Tmall. Um, they have a, a little bit of Ilma. So they're, they're everywhere. And then here's Tencent. So Tencent, everybody knows WeChat. Um, very important that if you're going to be investing into video, that WeChat only uses their own platform to feature onto WeChat. So you have to create a channel onto QQ, I'm uh, sorry, Tencent, Tencent Video, in order to get your content featured on there. And so here's just an example of what I'm talking about. So uh, I listed it out a few of these channels that how I would possibly build in a strategy on how I can incorporate it all. Now, I'll give you a, a quick example about this. So if you're, if you're going to be investing into, say, a company like C-Trip, uh, C-Trip will go, this is the amount of investment that I want. You want to think about what are your other channels? Because if you're promoting a video on one of their sister networks, you can actually tell them, hey, I'm going to promote your C-Trip package onto my video. So you can create a viral video about your C-trip package into your destination. And a lot of times, a lot of companies overseas, they tend to just go negotiate by themselves. And this is a, 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 can be a really big mistake if you're not familiar with the market. So negotiation is very, very big. That's why working with a local agency to be able to represent you, to talk to companies, to be able to get the best deal, the most value out of the investment you're making is very, very important. Um, because there's a lot of ways that you can negotiate beyond, beyond just, here's my price, here's what you're going to get. Um, and, and a lot of times, if you have someone in the market to be able to represent you, you're going to be able to not only get what they give you, but you can get add-ons based on if you have a very comprehensive uh, media strategy in place. Um, I'll share this with you guys. It's not a big deal. Um, I would say that this gives you an idea of what we're trying to do at every stage of the consumer journey. So when you're looking here at the search engine, we're trying to co-create content together. We're, a lot of times when you're working with UGC uh, uh, channels such as Chongyo, Mafoa, we control the content. You can control that content. You can influence what KOLs you want to use to write into that particular piece of channel. And then you can also use that same piece of content to push onto your 
your, your verticals, your destination partners. And really, when you get down to repeat uh, and recommend, you're going, you're, you're owning all the online content. When you see, uh, say, a comment underneath a popular blog, you're actually controlling that particular person's comment almost. Because you want to control your brand image. You want to influence them the way you want to influence them. And I think for every brand, it changes from you know, A or B. So that's something to always think about. Um, I think when, you, when Kim starts talking, you can see that even when you work on KOL, work with KOLs, you can tell a KOL what to write about. It's not always the KOL just knows what to write about because they may not have never been to that destination either. Um, so with that, that's it. That's my talk. Um, it's a very quick one. I could probably go for 45 minutes if we really went into detail, but um, that's it. So I'll hand it over to Alex. Cool. Thanks very much, Mike. I just want to apologize to some of the live stream viewers that we have had a little bit of a problem with the audio. We're working really hard to fix it right now. Everybody is going to try and speak loudly. And uh, please just be a little bit patient. If you can't hear us at all, we are going to upload the video later and we'll adjust the sound quality on the final video. So thank you very much for your patience. We've just got a few more people joining our audience now. And uh, so please keep asking your questions on the live stream and we'll try really hard at the end to um, answer those questions. Coming up now, we have our second speaker, um, who is Kim from Park Lu. She has um, many years experience here in China working on KOL campaigns and running a platform that uh, helps manage your KOLs. I will let uh, Kim get started. Hi. Welcome. Come on in. Come on in. <laughs> um, I'm Kim Leitzis from Park Blue, which is the KOL marketing platform. I moved from New York to Shanghai in 2010. Started a blog at that time, actually. It was mostly sharing uh, lifestyle and fashion um, recommendations. And that is how I discovered the whole universe of China influencers and bloggers and video creators. So um, I'm going to walk through some sort of tactical advice on the different ways that you can engage KOLs in China. And I'm going to actually move this chart. I'm going to do a little, is this OK if I move this over here? No one's answer. OK. <laughs> Um, sound check. Is sound check okay? I know it's kind of rough on Facebook. I think it's the China firewall that's interfering. So, great. So, um, just to start off, uh, what is an influencer in China? And when I talk about KOLs, which are key opinion leaders, I'm actually referring to non-celebrity influencers, right? So, we, we see the world as tiered between celebrity, top-tier KOLs, mid-tier KOLs, and micro-influencers. So just, just to give an example, um, Meli is a very famous travel blogger. She has, I think on Instagram, she has like over, over 700,000 followers on Instagram. She has 3.3 million followers on Weibo. And her WeChat account, her official account, typically gets over, on average, well over 50,000 views per post. Um, and then we have real like internet stars in Wang Hong and big uh, China uh, internet um, powerhouses like Lo Ji So Wei and Papi Zhang. And then we have on the other spectrum, we have celebrities like Angela Baby. So if you were as fortunate to be New Zealand, for example, you had a famous actress, Yao Chen, who had her wedding in New Zealand. And uh, the tourism group was very savvy there to step in and actually sponsor a lot of the wedding. And they said they, New Zealand saw a 30% increase and their Chinese tourists, you know, over, over a year. So in many regards, I think I'm being told to speak louder. Yes, okay. you are. <laughs> OK, I'll speak louder. <laughs> so, so basically, um, although I won't be specifically talking about celebrity marketing for um, destinations, it is actually a very powerful driver for, for a lot of places. So on the other spectrum, we have everyday people who have garnered massive followers. And the question is, how can your organization actually work with these KOLs, right? Because travel is not something you can package like a beauty care product or even wine and send it to, send it to someone and have them experience it. So the question is, we usually see three typical types of KOL engagement, one being product seeding, two being sponsored posts, 
And third, it's much more like a brand ambassadorship. It's a deep engagement, high level of content creation. So we'll give one example, which is actually a music festival in Thailand called Wonder Fruit. It's like a leading um, cultural and music experience. And although they, they wanted to promote the event and festival before it happened, so actually what they did was they engaged KOLs to actually give away tickets to, to the actual event itself. And through that process, they could share content, they could share videos, they could share pictures of past events, and really build the awareness and buzz. So this is just an example. If you could get two KOLs with a reach of half a million, what exactly can you, what can you see from that, right? So the second kind of engagement is a sponsored post. So this is very much when you have a very active campaign. You're looking to get a number of KOLs to both create original content and as well as help distribute that content. So oftentimes when you're creating your social media accounts, whether it's WeChat or Weibo, the question is, how do you actually grow your followers for that account? Right? And so KOLs becomes a key part of that strategy. So and I'm happy to go into more detail about this. Um, but basically, when you think about your KOL engagements, it's two parts. One is you are hiring a content creator, someone who creates something that's a storytelling experience. They're crafting that, that text, the video, the image, and then they have an audience that they're distributing to. Right? So there's um, a lot of outcry sometimes on the rising cost of KOL marketing. But if you think about it, what does it cost your organization to hire an agency to create that creative, shoot it professionally, and then distribute it? And so KOL is actually on a CPM basis, cost per engagement basis, actually become very, very palatable when you look at that from that lens. So here's an example where it's just one KOL. She was treated to a VIP experience at the Ritz-Carlton in Macau, right? And then and this was actually in collaboration with the media uh, as well, with Vogue. And they wanted to actually gauge, have her create original content for WeChat and drive followers for them. Okay, and the last one, which is very, very interesting and does take a lot of planning and a lot of selective, um, basically, vetting of KOLs, is building brand ambassadorships, right? This is a, it's a periodic engagement of KOLs who actually come and experience, whether it's your city, your retail business, and they, and they actually, not only do they create content when they're live there, but then it's also used afterwards for social content. So um, a very popular case study is what uh, El Corte Inglés did for Chinese New Year. So they had four KOLs. Um, they were rising, so not top tier influencers. Uh, one was a foodie, one was into culture, one was for fashion, and there was more lifestyle driven. They invited them to come to Madrid and have an insider experience. Right? They, there was a lot that was actually organized in the four day itinerary. And through this, they created content during and throughout the trip. And then afterwards, they created that content to activate digital campaigns as well. So during that period of time, they had incredible growth on their social media following. And they also had a lot of offline activations as well, on top of basically the way more WeChat advertising. So just to give you like a big picture of the different ways you can actually use KOLs, um, the, the cool thing is, is that it doesn't matter whether you are an SME or you have the extensive, bu the extensive budgets of, of larger, larger, larger organizations, KOL is a very accessible um, marketing tactic, but it does need the su full support of like an integrated campaign. So, um, do I have time to go through? Yes. Time? I have time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, okay, the tough thing about travel and tourism is actually measuring it and knowing how did it work. Right? Because it's not like e-commerce where you can immediately see traffic that converts within like a 24, 48-hour period. Right? So, so I think I just wanted to highlight a couple ways um, and tools that maybe you can actually attempt to have and just benchmark and actually track your cable marketing. So from the awareness level, we find one of the most exciting things is um, the WeChat data, or WeChat. Uh, it's kind of similar to um, Google Trends, uh, which is uh, basically WeChat Joshu. You can basically see the mentions and searches in WeChat for particular terms, right? So for destinations, for keywords, for your brand. So if you're working with WeChat KOL, um, or even KOLs in Weibo, are you seeing an increase in search in WeChat, whereas people are, where people are spending 80% of their time? 
right. um, obviously from the community level, you can see, do, have I had any increases in my followers and fans and the engagement level there? Um, and comparing that social media growth to what it costs you to run WeChat and Weibo advertising to get the same results, right? Finding that relative cost. From a content creation perspective, you know, if you think about it, uh, you know, and I'm, Alex will go into this more about how you manage and optimize your content creation, KOLs very much are creating um, authentic, excellent content. So there's a, a appreciating that creation that you can also use in your social channels. And of course, there's traffic. So um, we've worked with both hotel companies as well as duty-free businesses, where they have, you know, they can track traffic to whether it's a landing page, a booking page, um, or even a click and collect um, page for duty-free. So, so I think that is one way. But again, that's not always that's not always easy for for all businesses. Um, and of course, there is the sales route, which meetings are tracking on a cost uh, cost per commission basis or affiliate basis. Um, again, much harder in the travel space, but just to give you the full spectrum of how people actually look at KOL marketing and how it's measured. Um, all right, Parkville, we have a cool dashboard. <laughs> so when you're running campaigns, you have the data updated in real time, um, just to give you a preview. And for those of you who have more questions on uh, how to do KOL marketing, I'm Kim Lightsis. Feel free to ping me. And for those of you on Facebook, um, we will definitely have a recorded version of this so you can capture everything. Okay, and so key takeaways. Um, understand when you're working with KOLs that they are people and it's all about the relationships, right? You are looking to build long-term um, advocacy from them. Um, yes, they are successful media in their own right, the Métis, their own media, but they are very much looking for opportunities to create good content. This is what you have to offer. Travel is one of the most exciting things to offer a KOL. They want experiences. They want unique experiences. They want to bring innovative content to their audiences. And so this is, this is what you lead with, right? That's, and, and so it's very much an attractive opportunity for a lot of KOLs. We have seen brands work with top tier KOLs who normally charge 100,000 RMB and up for a WeChat post, but for a trip to Europe, sure, they're on board. Right, so, so this is a very, um, this is an incredible opportunity for tourism businesses. Um, of course, make sure you know what your objectives are and clearly set up that tracking for success because this is something where you want to iterate and improve over time. And you want to fundamentally find your brand ambassadors and find those long-term partnerships for creating content. Okay, and that is Cool, my thanks for your help, Kim. I'm still on the hot mic, right? Yes, you still have a hot mic on, so... Uh, uh, how do I get rid of it? <laughs> they'll, they'll help you out over there. I just want to apologize again to anybody who was watching on Facebook. We're still having some audio problems. I'm very sorry. Um, this is the first time we've done a live stream event like this, and uh, the internet in China is not always our friend, I'm afraid. So we will be uploading this to YouTube afterwards. So I'm going to be your final speaker um, for today, and I'm going to try and speak very loudly so that um, all of our Facebook audience can hear clearly. Um, I'm Alex Duncan, and I am the uh, leader of KWO.com. We have been going for uh, four years here in China. We were founded by the Mailman Group Agency, and we're a software platform that helps international brands in China to manage their social content. So today, I'm going to be giving you eight tips for better social content in China. Um, we have about uh, 300 brands on our platform, and we follow many more thousands of accounts on uh, Weibo. And so we see a huge amount of uh, variation in how different brands tackle um, social. And so based on the data and the things we see happening on our platform, here are some advice um, that we're able to uh, hand out. So um, these, are the, these are the eight tips we're going to be uh, looking at today. So consistency, frequency, timing, planning, zeitgeist, localization, collaboration, and community. Um, these slides will also be up online afterwards um, if you want to have a look at them. So first, consistency. Now, a lot of this really isn't rocket science. If you look at this graph of um, when brands post, and this is... Uh, on uh, wait, this is actually Weibo data you're looking at here. 
you'll notice that there is this pattern here, 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 here. And I'll ask anybody in the audience now, does anybody have any idea what that might be? This is when brands post. Does anybody know anything about what that pattern might be? So this is actually weekends. So at weekends, people post a lot less content. But actually, the engagement at weekends is not worse than the engagement during the week. So if you were to post at weekends, you would get a lot more visibility, almost free. It's not really um, very hard. So yeah, so we recommend um, posting every day on Weibo, including weekends, even when your team are not there. Um, and posting weekly and ideally on the same day on uh, WeChat. So the next thing is frequency. We've seen many cases of brands. We've seen brands posting as much as 20, 30, 40 times in a single day. And we've seen people posting just one or two times a week. So we've run data across um, hundreds of thousands of posts. And this is roughly um, the trend we see. This along the bottom here is the number of posts. And then up the side is a measure of engagement. If you get to about five posts, you get less engagement per post from that point onward. So if you post 25 times, you're not actually doing a lot better than uh, if you post just uh, five times a day. So our recommendation for tourism brands specifically is to post three to six times per day. And that might seem a lot for a lot of foreign um, destinations. That might be more than you're used to posting on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But based on the data we're seeing, um, you should be posting three to six times per day on Weibo. Timing. Again, none of this is rocket science. So this is aggregated data across quite a few uh, months um, on when people engage with your content throughout the day. So we're starting with midnight, and we're going um, to 11 PM there. You'll see there's two kind of distinct points in the day when you're going to be getting more engagement. So again, very simple. Um, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. are our recommendations for um, when you should aim to release your content. If you actually use our product, we actually do something a little bit more clever. We build a prediction just for your account, which may vary depending on the type of account you have. Um, next, planning. So one of the very interesting things about the Chinese market being so different is that it maybe takes more of a mindset Mind, a bit of a shift in mindset sometimes for different teams um, to understand your destination if you have teams in China. So we think it's even more important for tourism accounts in China to plan ahead. Um, you need to be scheduling your posts um, way in advance and making sure you have good collaboration between your local team who speak Chinese, write Chinese, and um, write the content and your Western team who understand the destination better. So we recommend planning about four to six weeks ahead. This gives you more time to uh, um, adjust where necessary. Um, Zeitgeist. Now, this is probably, again, um, almost, almost seems obvious, but the topics that trend in China can be very different to the topics that trend in the West. There was a great example of a story that went viral and actually made a little bit of uh, press in the West as well. The story of Brother Orange. And I'm not going to go into it now, but I recommend you check it out. It's a really good read. There's a long article on BuzzFeed. Now, if you're able to attach the content you're creating to um, some of the content you're creating to trending events, then that's a great opportunity um, to get more engagement and uh, capture more of the moment. Recent examples, you saw a lot of brands in the West jumping on the United Airlines scandal with their own take on the situation. It's exactly the same in China, but the topics are different, and it may be a little harder to understand how your brand can get involved with them. We recommend at least 30% of your content is related to trending topics. So localization. Now, this is... Um, this really is kind of the, the, the probably out of all these eight points, this is one of the most important. Because the messages that work for a tourism destination around the world are likely to be very different to the ones that work in China. China's market has grown so fast. The number of people traveling abroad has been increasing by five to 10 million a year for the last few years. 
These are very new um, travelers abroad in some ways. They have a different level of understanding. They want different things to many other types of consumer. But social media is a fantastic way to understand them better. You can analyze your content in different ways. And this is just actually a inside our application. And we actually help you look at which topics are more interesting to your, um, your followers. Because creating content is a big investment. It can be very expensive to find the images, write the copy. It requires a lot of time and effort. So you want to be putting that effort into content that is resonant with the audience. And so identifying what themes work better. Just a great example to kind of give you some sense of perspective. If you're marketing Australia, these images over here are probably a lot more interesting to Chinese um, travelers than the ones on the right. They're possibly less adventurous. And they maybe don't want to go and hang out in the outback as much as they'd like to eat seafood and hang out in Sydney. This is just one tiny example of the kind of things that you uh, might come across. There are also different levels of traveler. You've got travelers who have never been to your destination. They need a different type of content to travelers who are more familiar with your destination. So you have to create a mix of content targeted at different levels of traveler and very much focused on the persona for this market. OK, so this is my takeaway on localization. Social media, you know, if you're thinking about doing focus groups and uh, insights research, actually, social media could be a really powerful, more cost-effective way to get a deep insight into what consumers are thinking, just by creating content and seeing what resonates. OK, collaboration. Now, this is a really interesting one, because our product is all about collaboration. And we see so many good and bad examples. Imagine a typical situation. You have Wendy, who works. She's the brand manager for your overseas destination. You have Eric. And he's the local content editor. He may work for your organization. He may work for your agency. But the key thing is you've got two people here with very different expertise. And so making sure that they work closely together is so important. Wendy, she knows the destination way better than Eric does. He may not have been there. He possibly doesn't know the difference, like which bridge is this in New York. He may use the wrong content on the wrong day, the wrong time. Wendy's expertise on the destination is super important on the product, on the experience. But Eric, he's the guy that knows the Chinese market well. And he knows the nuance, and he understands um, how the message should be conveyed better in China. So actually, collaboration is incredibly important to work closely with the two, um, the two teams together. We've actually built a lot of our product around helping better collaboration across different demographics in uh, different markets. So this is, again, super important. Um, seventh point, close and regular communication with local team and partners. So the final of my um, eight points today is community. So again, we have access to a lot of data. And we see some really interesting things here. If you are able to work in collaboration with other destinations in your area, you're going to create much more of an impact by working together with people who perhaps in other areas are your competitors. In China, actually, they're your partners. This is a great example. New York City reposted um, a post by uh, the um, Empire State Building. This is exactly the kind of thing that destinations should be aiming to do. Countries should repost cities and um, destinations. National parks should repost each other and create the feeling of really exciting places for people to go and travel. This is um, a, probably the hardest of our points to uh, achieve, but it's actually one of the most impactful in terms of uh, how to get your brand message out there. So final point, work together. Um, I just want to finally to mention KWO. Um, we are the number one social platform for overseas DMOs um, managing social media in China. And you can find out more on our website, KWO.com. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you managed to uh, hear what I was saying. Don't worry, if not, we'll upload the video later. And now we're going to have a quick panel discussion. We have some questions from um, the, uh, our website. And we're also going to look at questions coming from the live stream. I'd like to invite Mike and Kim back to the stage, and uh, we'll now answer some questions. Do you want to move into the middle? So you're actually <laughs> okay.
So um, I'll start with taking a question from the audience. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? Sweet. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll, uh, we'll look at one from online. Okay, so um, this is a very interesting one. Um, how how to gain WeChat followers, specifically WeChat followers? Let me start by asking Mike. What do you think about that one? Uh, it's funny. I was just writing. A, I was just responding to an RFP about this. It's very. It's also very WeChat focused. For us, it's. Concentrate on content, and that's your two-pronged approach. But you have to have a layer of marketing underneath to support that. And it could, <clears throat> I'm sure Kim can touch on a little bit about this. But we we focus on KOLs. We focus on uh, media strategy, looking at the entire destination, on how we can be involved in different places. Because even if you're building uh, WeChat followers, and you're, the obvious approach, of course, WeChat ads, uh, geo targeting, being able to purchase through there. The creative way is uh, spreading your content out, getting people to recognize you more, uh, and then using those channels as additional pieces of promotion because it's becoming more and more difficult to get real WeChat followers because the market itself is becoming more and more competitive. Kim, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? I think they want you to move on to camera. Oh. You're currently off screen. Move over. Sorry. <laughs> I have to be in the live stream to be in the live stream. Okay. Um, yeah, from, from my perspective, uh, KOLs are both the content creators as well as distribution for your content, right? And they can bring their followers and audience to your community with, with the right level of storytelling. So oftentimes we see brands when, and organizations when they're first starting out. Um, they're very much working with KOLs to create some of that initial content, so it has legs in distribution. Um, because when you're just creating content and you don't have any followers, it's very hard for that to get seeded. So that's that's usually what we see. Cool. Thanks very much. We have an audience question. Just, just on the brand ambassadorship, and as you said, it's a very difficult thing to do. When you're selecting, a, I suppose, a partnership between a brand ambassador and a brand, you know, how long is that relationship expected to last? And is that something that goes beyond what would start off as being financial and to be something that is, you know, obviously there's always money involved, but something that is a, becomes a team, event, team thing to grow you know, a product or a brand? So, so, to, so the question was, um, how do you grow a brand ambassadorship program? And then specifically, how long do those last for? Um, and three, like, what do those kind of arrangements look like, right? So, so the first question, um, for a lot of organizations, you want to first test and iterate, right, before you scale up these kind of programs. So um, I'll give an example. It's a, a company we're working with. It's specifically Irish and UK baby products. And they happened to find a Chinese mom who had just relocated there. And so she live streams every day. And um, she started with, she was very much a micro-influencer who just had a couple hundred to now 10,000 views per live stream. And on top of that, actually directs um, WeChat followers and traffic to their WeChat shop. So um, that's a very geolocation-based um, brand ambassadorship program. And what started as, purely like product gifting, as I mentioned in my presentation, it is now something that they're looking to test and roll out. And not necessarily um, Chinese live streamers who are located in Ireland, for example. So, so I think that's like one example. And the question is how long? Usually brands are pretty experienced at this, are, doing, are looking for something that will be at least several months, say you know six months, six to 12 months. Um, and it does require the content to engage them over that period of time. So if you were working with like a top tier influencer and they came to your destination and they made the experience, you want to make sure that they have enough content so they can actually post that content following the event, right? And uh, not necessarily during, not just for only during when they were there, but then afterwards. Cool. Thanks very much, Kim. I know Mike has um, a bit of experience with more sort of longer term KOL relationships. Do you want to add anything to that? 
I think it really depends on uh, the type of, like she was saying, the type of influencer. So if you have like a celebrity, I mean, more, more than likely, if you want the celebrity to be your brand ambassador, the longer they're your brand ambassador, the more effective it's going to be for your brand. But the choice of that celebrity is also very important. You know, we've had some clients in the past to go do a lot of background checks on them because you never know what kind of things that they've hit in the past. Some brands are more sensitive to um, some things that the KO has done in the past. Even in China, sometimes it doesn't really matter as much. But uh, for the most part, all our clients who work overseas, they care about that stuff. And they expect uh, either you or your agency to do a good background check to make sure that uh, whoever's representing you over the long haul um, is clean, represents your well, represents your culture, represents... Uh, your your messaging um, and that alignment is just supremely important as you're starting to grow your brand in, in the market. Um, so that question, let me just repeat it for our live stream viewers: Are the followers on uh, WeChat and Weibo? Um, more or less tolerance to KOL's advertising for brands? Kim, I'll start with you. Well, the Chinese consumer is very savvy. They know when there's sponsored content and when there's not. And what matters is whether or not the content is good. Whether it was informative, whether it was a good story, whether it was entertaining, whether the photos and the video were well produced. Um, this has been on since the age of time of Weibo, which is not so long ago. And and so I think it comes down to, is the content something the audience wants to see? Uh, just before I pass over to Mike, I mean, they recently um, changed the regulations on WeChat. So you now are forced to declare, right, if your um, content is sponsored. And you can get in trouble if you're found out, right? You know, I, I could talk a little bit more about that. I think um, you guys who are the brand owners who represent your brand, you know the brand better than anyone else. Well, you should, anyways. Um, and... When you work with the KOL, you can control, you see the types of methods that you could work with the KOL. You can control everything from what they write about to what you want other people to convey. And I mean, you can even get creative where you can get multiple KOLs converse with each other to make it seem natural as well. Um, I think from a marketing strategy point of view, it all depends on uh, your messaging at the end of the day. Um, if you let them control too much of your message, too much of the messaging, it could might hurt your brand in the in the long run, um, but if you have more control of your brand in the short term and you're able to strategize with them to get them excited or uh, sound more natural even from a tone, um, I think it's less likely for them to be like for even like followers or people to think that it's it's an ad, and really like nobody likes ads like that's just the way. It <laughs> We think it's about guidelines as opposed to creative control because fundamentally the KOL knows what their audience likes, but what they really need from brand marketers is the, the information, right? They need, they, that, that's, that, you know, the, the insider's perspective on what to do in New York. Like, they need the content and support from that regard. So that's what makes them author the authorities on, on these subjects. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, we have a couple of questions coming from the uh, comments on live stream. We've got a softball one first. They said, any recommendation for a social media tool? Well, I can definitely recommend uh, KO for that one. <laughs> so thanks for that question, whoever asked that. Um, they also asked about uh, social listening. Um, we don't actually do social listening, but there are some uh, pretty good platforms out there. Um, social listening is generally um, a bit more expensive. You can look at, um, depending on what you're, you're wanting, social listening on WeChat is very hard. And um, from the data we see, it can't really be trusted that well. But uh, there are platforms like um, Radily from the company uh, Linkfluence, who um, we have worked with. And they're generally um, very good for social listening. So you can contact them about a campaign. Um, I'm now going to switch to another question that might be quite relevant um, for uh, some smaller brands um, out there, which is, where do you start with um, attracting Chinese tourists? Let, I mean, this is, this is a very interesting question because we get this quite a lot. And um, I think maybe Mike will have some 
uh, something to say on this. Like, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're and I was looking at the question that the banner, I was like, oh, what am I going to say for that? And then I was like, wait a second, that's not the question. So yeah. What was it? So the the question is, where do you start? If you're doing nothing right now, what's the best place to start? And you know, how much is that going to cost? And, and what does that look like? Because there are lots of brands they are already up and running, and they're spending, um, you know, thousands, if not millions. But where do you start if you've got nothing going on? I think. The most important thing is to state your goals and objectives. I think that you have to be very, very clear about because social media is a long-term play. It's it, it, and in some cases, it's it's about um, understanding that a lot of a lot of brands think that they can come into a market and then all of a sudden just hey, where's my followers? There's there's uh, 1.4 billion people in China. What do you mean you can't get me 50,000 followers? Um, and it's also uh, to be aligned with uh, whether it's your internal team or your external team, what your KPIs and what are the most important things? Like, how do you measure followers versus engagement? What's actually the most important thing to you and what should be most important thing? So if you're a new brand starting in market, do your research first. I think research comes at the very beginning, um, understanding who your consumers are, because your consumers are going to be very different depending on uh, which vertical of business you're under. Um, I would recommend to, even before you jump on social, um, do small uh, like sessions to understand uh, key questions that you want to find out about because then that can build your content strategy. That can tell you what your KOL strategy should be. And so then you produce content that people actually want to read because um, to me that's the most important thing is that preparation in the beginning before you even get started onto a social media platform and get on Weibo. You have to know what direction you're going to be going um, along the way. Kim, how about you? Where should where should brands start? <laughs> Hire the right person. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it starts with the the right boots on the ground. Um, you know, I think you did a great show of was it Wendy and mm, Eric, Eric yeah. right? Um, I think that that is that is where it all starts is actually the people with, um, with your marketing strategy, and um, in some respects. Uh, you have agencies that will help you with this in the beginning, but eventually your organization knows the destination and the product best. Right. So, uh, starts with mailman. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, uh, I, I I would just extend a little bit, like on, on the focus groups. Um, you know, really good KOLs do this too. They ask their fans, "What content do you want me to do?" Right. And so they have the fortune of actually having a dedicated uh, following that they can query that to. Um, and I think given that it's so easy now to search on social, to see what um, tourists are actually taking photos of and talking about your destination, that is something, the data's out there, right? Um, and that doesn't even necessarily require a fancy social listening tool in the beginning to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I would start. And find out, like, and, lo and really understand, like, who is the traveler you're targeting? You know, is it families? Is it um, independent travelers, millennials? Like this is this is very much first know who your target group is. Okay, I just want to ask one very simple question. Um, if a brand's thinking of getting started, what would you say is the absolute minimum they can spend on a monthly basis to get started marketing to Chinese tourists? <laughs> just give me just give me a number. <laughs> I'm only the KOL part. I'm. <laughs> Uh, nothing's free. Um, <laughs> look, I think you have to look at social as an investment, like I said. Um, for us, we, we hire people who are uh, experienced in the field of writing in for Chinese consumers. Um, if you're serious about building a team, um, before we even give you a number of where you start, we have to understand, again, what your objectives are. And what your budget is, because there's no point to say, hey, a minimum cost for us is X amount per month. It's about um, understanding that if you're going to be going in with the agency, you are ready to go on that almost a luxury kind of path because you have to be ready to spend to build a team somewhere else. But if you're a brand that has that wants to start social, then yeah, hire internal. You could probably find a digital editor. Um, and someone that can build and write content. The difference between from you hiring in-house versus hiring, uh, say, an agency like Mailman is that we put the strategic thinking behind 
uh, understanding your brand and guiding you in the market. Um, and so, yeah, there's additional costs for that. But I don't, I don't discourage anybody out there that goes, hey, I, I want to hire my own digital editor. I want to start uh, my own channel to write content. I think producing content is really important. But the last point I'll make is that you have to respect the experience of people who actually write content as in it's not just a like, so I mean that was a great answer but like <laughs> what's the number <laughs> like what number should they not even bother calling you if they don't have that budget for us we we for us we actually say a minimum of say 10,000 US dollars a month at the very minimum because we're looking at uh, building a team around you okay so I can give you at, at that as a general number we say as a minimum it might not even include any media budget or anything that include, uh, uh, that encompasses into that particular budget. But um, we're we created an agency that offers a different level of service, in our opinion, um, and we've been able to build that reputation over the last five years. So, I mean, if you are looking to do it really lean, then I mean, KWO would allow you to sort of help self-manage. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And and KWO only starts from two hundred US a month. <laughs> um, so, Kim, you what? Make me sound expensive. Well. Um, so I'm speaking for. Okay, so I, I I think there are two very different kinds of budgets. Basically, there are SMEs, and then you have global organizations, which um, are investing very heavily in multiple marketing channels, right? Um, but what we are seeing is a growth and in investment in KOL both in China and as well as outside China. So um, you'll see statistics for SMEs, both in China and outside China, it's 80% of their marketing budget will go to KOL, right? And it very depends. It very much depends on their strategy. China's a market where over half of the top apparel tab out sellers are KOLs, right? The KOLs today build their own businesses, right? Um, they are content creators, and this is something that is very much not going away and a significant portion of people's budgets. So um, from our perspective, we, we do see companies doing it from a lean way, but it does take a lot of relationship building, um, a lot of in-kind exchange. Um, for something like travel, it's very much about gifting experiences. That's, and that has a cost to it, right? Flights, accommodation, there's a cost to that. Um, so. So yeah, I mean, we, we, we see brands who are at least at a minimum willing to dedicate 100,000 US being the most successful because you, you get what you invest in. Um, and then we've also seen leaner budgets where they're doing KOL campaigns for even like 10,000 US. Um, Park Lu, our, our subscription-based platform, which gives you access to 10,000 plus travel, fashion, lifestyle influencers, you know, we start, we have two, two options and basically subscription base is 500 US a month. Again. So just um, kind of, I think I think you uh, you answered another question we just had coming on live stream about KOL budgets. So um, that I'll have to look for another question for us to ask now. Does anybody in the audience have one? No. Okay. We do have another question that was submitted in advance from Sarah in the U.S. And she wants to know about um, when it comes to selling our features and benefits. Are there certain factors? that a Chinese traveler is looking for in an American travel experience. To be honest, you probably have one of the world exports, but it's in uh, American travel for Chinese tourists I've, right next to me. I've probably talked about this quite a bit in the past. I think what makes a real difference between a Chinese traveler and anywhere else is that uh, the language is very different. It's very important to talk to them in the way that they like to read. Um, but most importantly, uh, if I say the most, is that Chinese people, they like details. I mean, if you are writing, if it's a KOL writing a blog or anything like that, don't be afraid if it's 15 pages long. We've, we've handed off a project once to uh, a writer who wrote about renting a car. And you would think that that is like the most basic thing. But she came back and wrote a 15-page booklet about how to rent a car in the U.S. And the feedback there was that they all loved that. Everyone loved it. Because... We as, I mean, I would say we, but like, you know, if you're an American or you're a Western person, you think of renting a car, that's very straightforward. Go on the site, pick your car, make sure whatever, click all the boxes. But the Chinese person wants to know about what am I clicking? And it, it, what, what clicking, what car should I rent? Uh, all the way down to what are the colors that, that mean on the side of the road? You know, every single tips and tricks that you can tell the person, they all take that as 
they're getting ahead of the game, right? If you can offer like, hey, if you go to this website, get a coupon, this is the cheapest, like, they love that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm Chinese American. I base some of my experience on just my mother. So I know how Chinese people really think sometimes. And um, I think details are really important. And I, I'll give you one more example, which is we worked with a travel blogger once. Um, and he wrote basically three paragraphs about not forgetting to bring a water bottle onto the air, airplane. And it was like a tedious three paragraphs if I read it. But to, for a Chinese word, they're like, well, that's a good tip because there's no water when you get on the plane. So remember to definitely look around, shop around, and bring water onto the airplane. And those are little tidbits that really make uh, content successful because it comes from personal experience. And I think uh, when you look at attracting followers, you have to remember what are the things that Chinese people are used to, slippers, hot tea, hot water, all the way up until um, when you're writing content, what kind of content should you be writing and the length of content. Just to extend on that, when you mentioned personal experience, yeah. Where does it sit with, with you know, Anglo-Saxon or Westerners' personal experience versus the Chinese personal experience in terms of the influence, or well, how much are the influenced by that? Because I think it's shifted the last couple of years that Chinese would prefer information from another Chinese person rather than a Western person telling them what they can and can't do. Yeah, I think it depends on the the influencer. Um, I think. Uh, the Chinese person would like if you watch like a really popular some of these popular videos are the, why they're successful is because you're watching someone do it and they get excited over it they think it's fun um, and that provides a different kind of influence to say if you're a Western person walking around just doing kind of like marketing fluff around a destination that won't provide a, as high of an influence but there's dependencies to that particular question and we can talk more. And just to uh, catch that for the live stream in case nobody caught it, we're just asking why uh, is um, do people prefer their information to come from another Chinese person or a Western source? And I'll just uh, let Kim have a moment on that. <laughs> they want it from someone they trust. <laughs> it, it's no different. It's actually no different. Um, yeah, and uh, to talk about KOL some more. <laughs> um, they, a lot of them actually have been doing and creating content for quite a while. Oftentimes more than, it take, you know, you don't develop a following overnight. It usually takes a couple of years. So um, they've built trust with their audience. And, you know, even if they're sharing tips of ice like bringing water onto the plane, um, that's something that the, the readers really, you know, and fans really take into account. So, um, and they also know, okay, does this influencer fit my lifestyle? Do I is it aspirational? Do I you know do they fit my needs? Like is their lifestyle like mine? And, and that's a large part of it too. Uh, just, let me just add on one more thing: is that if you want to get ahead of the game, you're in a hotel, your airline, your anybody, just you can do very simple things that can organically get people to talk about your location. So I'll use slippers for example. If you ever go on a flight, you're flying to the states. You, I've once seen a Chinese person in economy try to steal the pair of slippers in business class just so he'll have the slippers to walk around in. Okay, you'd be surprised how many hotel chains that don't even provide this in the US. That means they're not conducive to the Chinese traveler, but if they do provide it and they have the hot water kettle and things like this, these are the, these are the points where um, they'll go back and that's where word of mouth gets really important. You know, they'll post on their moments, they'll be like, oh, this place is great. I mean, they might not go like, well, I got hot water, but if the experience is really good, there, there's multi-language available. You have ways to get them to talk about your location without you actually doing anything because those are the type of ambassadors that you want to start building even beyond just uh, finding KOLs to go talk to about Everybody's your location. About. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, we just have one. We're going to take one more question from uh, online, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll see if we have time. I think we're running a little bit short on time. So, um, this last question is from uh, somebody from the Pandanus Beach Resort in Sri Lanka, and they're wanting to know specifically about premium um, Chinese travelers. Is there anything that's different about attracting premium Chinese travelers to uh, maybe the mass tourists 
If you're a very high-end resort, what should you do differently? Well, premium travel. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, I think premium and luxury um, targeting is is very well. There's two parts of it. One of it is very much word of mouth, right? And two is um, particularly in the travel segment. I think that actually these prestige uh, travel agencies are very important because um, they are basically uh, they have the networks to target these kinds of um, audiences. Whereas a premium travel KOL would actually be very, very niche. Because if you think about it, that content creation is very, very expensive, right? So, um, so from, I mean, that would just be my candid advice. Um, though the best way to attract, um, uh, the best way to actually probably build awareness on premium travel experience is through actually probably celebrities. That's my guess. Um, you've seen this with Bali. We've seen this with New Zealand. We've seen this with UK. Celebrity weddings are um, huge um, in terms of building awareness for premium experiences. It's created a huge lift in um, Chinese weddings in Bali because of this. Mike, how about you? Well, I don't, do you have time? Yeah, just do you have any things to say on the premium sector of the market? Um, I don't have that much to say, actually. I think... Um, you know, we, we, we ran a couple of accounts with the, you know, Luxury Resort. That was one of our clients before. Um, if some people only want to attract a premium, but a lot of people who, who look at luxury, they're looking at masses, right? Like, I, it's a weird example to float to, but if, say, for example, you're the NFL and you have all these people who already know about it, you're not going to keep wanting to talk to only those people. You're trying to expand your reach. So we focus on when we're run, run, say back to the luxury example, we're going to look at different verticals, right? People, if it's about food, maybe you just talk a whole month about food, or you talk about wedding look, wedding locations that you can do over there. I think it, it can attract. Uh, weddings are huge, right? So you don't necessarily have to be luxury. That's the one time when people will spend more money, and they're looking for the best locations. I have no experience about this, but I'm just. I was going to say, where was your <laughs> wedding? <laughs> Okay, I think that's actually all we have time for today. Um, I'm sure the panel will hang around for a few minutes to ask, answer any other questions. And of course, once we upload this video onto YouTube or other platforms, you can ask questions in the comments and we will try and respond back to you. Um, I want to thank very much Mike from the Mailman Group and Kim from Park Blue and I'm Alex from KRO. And thank you very much for tuning in today. Thanks.